the Mind Body Connection podcast. The body and mind. With your host, Dr. Phil Parker. Here's the second part of Reese's story. He's got to the point where he realizes he's got a problem and he needs to do something about it. And I actually went to AA that two day, two or three days after that. And typical addict, I thought I knew it all at this point. So, you know, I went to a couple of meetings. I'd taken out of it what I needed to hear. Right. Oh, yeah. Sorted. I don't need a sponsor. I don't need anything. I'll just, I'll work. I don't need to work the steps. I don't even know. They don't, they're irrelevant. They're just, and who, what's this God business? You know, higher power. I'm not listening to that. I've got this, I got this covered. And um, unfortunately, how it worked is I just instantly cross addicted. I started to use THC and CBD drops. Um, I game in for hours on end on FIFA, like literally playing uh, FIFA Ultimate Team for six to eight hours a day. I wouldn't even move. You know, the kids would go to school, they'd come home from school, I'd be on the, on the PS4. Um, and it was a whole range of other issues, social issues outside of the home, which were just it was just really unhealthy situation. That's such a common story where people switch from one particular substance or behavior, but still carry on with the same kind of destructive way of being. Yeah. Well, I've, I, I found out later on that, that that was what was described as a dry drunk because I never, none of my behaviors actually changed. Um, and I actually became more miserable. I became, uh, you know, I was trying to find other ways to, address my emotions and feelings, but by not dealing with my emotions and feelings, by drowning them out, you know, by not paying them any attention. I was just running away. It was a fear. I was completely riddled with fear. I was, I was, you know, inside I was very scared, but I didn't realize it because I dug my feelings down so deep and buried it with so much alcohol over such a long period of time, you know, and it was, my situation was unfortunate, for me, but I had, you know, I had an amazing life. I succeeded in everything I put my mind to. I achieved my greatest goal, my lifelong goal. I mean, how many people get to say that they did that? But then to have it taken away from me like I did, I used that as a self-pity tool, which drove my alcoholism, which made me a sick, even worse a sick person because I had an excuse. What would you do if that happened to you? You know, I would just put that on people. Like, that's... That's the unfortunate situation of what it was like. And uh, what when I was you look like, back was, at it, do, do you think that the emotional kind of denial and suppression had an effect on your heart? That, or do you just think it had nothing to do with it? Do you think there's a connection between how you were living your life emotionally and physically? Or was just yeah. unlucky that you got this? Yeah. I mean... I suppose I'll never know is the answer to that. There's things that I think that may have, it may have impacted. Uh, and I'm only just, you know, starting to now scratch the surface of how, how much impact I think for mentally that amount of chaos that was in my life, in my playing career and post career and how that had a huge impact on my heart. And I'm starting to understand that more and more as the months go by, you know, um, I've actually I think, it's, I think it's something that months. I think it's something it'd be interesting to talk about as well. We'll finish the story as well, but just how how we can help youngsters, particularly young boys, you know, to learn about this stuff in different ways rather than having to hit the wall, you know, to hit rock yeah. bottom to understand these things are important and not silly or effeminate or whatever it is that gets yeah. in the way of because partly it's society isn't it society is telling these stories about what boys can do what girls can do what emotions are allowed to be expressed but let's carry on with your story so yeah no, no, I, I, completely, I completely agree yeah because i think i'm all about preventative measures so prevention rather than cure because you know if this is why i feel that my story can be very relevant given that, you know, mental health and well-being has really come before, that if, if I can tell people that had I been able to not be so stubborn and, and put my pride aside for a little bit and just fuck my ego away because it was completely out of control, had I been able to just speak to someone about it and stop being so stoic, you know, could that have been, you know, could I have seen a way through that chaos? a way to like combat 
you know, not having to go to the destructive levels that I was going to, to realize, oh, maybe I shouldn't be doing that, or I shouldn't have done that, or I regret that. And then that vicious cycle just going round and round. So you, so you hit rock bottom and then you ended up heading towards AA and then you kind of stepped away from it and then you got, I'm guessing you got back in it. And, yeah. and then what? Well, I, I then in February, uh, sorry, end of January, I went to see a friend in Mauritius. Uh, funnily enough, one of my best friends, he's a recovering alcoholic. We was in school together. And we went there and I told, and I was very proud at this point because I hadn't had a drink from the first September till the end of Jan. But when I went there, it was a cyclone. We got stuck inside. And at this point, my, my ex-wife was literally hating me. And, my, you know, it, was, it was caused a lot of rift within the family, There's a lot of friction in the house. And unfortunately, my children had to be witness to that, which, you know, was very unfortunate. And he then just blurted it all out. You know, I told him what I'd even been like since I stopped alcohol. And while I was actually on holiday there for a week in Mauritius, my my best friend had found all my other mates from school and my brother and my dad and said, right, he needs to go to rehab. And without me knowing, without even knowledge of that fact, they had organized me a 28-day stint in a rehab in Cape Town. And um, on the day before I was leaving, the, he, he said, right, you're not going home with the family. You're going to rehab. And I was like, no, that's not happening. And he was like, yes, it is. I said, why? I'm not, I'm not an alcoholic. I've over for five months and he said yeah but your addictive behavior is still there like Paul has told us about and so I ended up going and it was the best thing that I ever did it was literally the most eye-opening painful completely invigorating experience of my life I learned more in 28 days than I had done in 37 years it was it was just a stripping down of all you know all taking all the masks down, stripping away the onion, the, like, the onion skins to their core and just being able to feel vulnerable. And that vulnerability allowed me to share things that, you know, in a, in a, in a space where I'm surrounded by like-minded people and with incredible team that was there at, at the rehab were able to get me to offload all of that baggage that I'd been carrying around with me for so many years, a lot of shame, remorse and guilt and I just I was, I was exhausted for honestly of living that lifestyle that life of chaos and what I thought was in the end fun and it just wasn't you know I was just full of fear I was scared I was actually completely petrified inside you know I'd, of all this problems I'd have with my physical and mental health but deep down I was just very vulnerable and afraid then when I was actually able to express that and and understand my and get my feelings back almost because I'd lost touch with them, it had been so long. Um, because the way that I had dealt with it from a very early age was wrong. Um, just to bury my feelings and not address them, just to run away and use substances or people or other things just to take my attention away from them, or rugby, whatever it was, you know. And um, you what, know, would, it was, um what would your self from 10 years ago make of you saying this now because i mean what's amazing about i mean it is an amazing story but also the way you talk about it now you're so authentically open and honest about how shit it was how awful yeah. your behaviors were how ridiculous it was but not in a way you're giving yourself a hard time you're just being yeah. straight about it but yeah what would uh, your you from say 10 years ago make of this I'd be like, honestly, I, I get this all the time from my mates. Like, they're ringing me. Oh, he's seen the light, boys. He's seen the light. <laughs> Leave him alone. Because that's what I would have been like. I would have been like, oh, God, he, he's in the God squad now, you know. And he's seen the light. He's a born-again Christian. I would have been absolutely flying into me. The me of 10 years ago would be flying into me. And, um, you know, that's like, I'm okay with that. Because, you know what? Like, I have learned so much, you know, it, that 28 days, stories I heard in there, the addicts that I was surrounded with, addicts of all descriptions, talking crack, crystal meth, heroin, um, sex, you name it, right? And all their stories about the, and I didn't know them from a bar of soap, and then they tell me about their addiction histories. And then, like, I instantly had these judgments about all these people in the house, but then once I heard their addiction histories and what they had been through to get to this point, like, it just completely blew my mind. It was 
the most mind blowing experience of my life. And it's absolutely at that point, you know, I, my judgment of other human beings went out the window because until you actually know what that person's going through, how can I possibly judge them? Because whether they are being um, mean to others or they've got other, you know, they're projecting behaviors that perhaps they only saw their father or their, you know, role models bring up how they were brought up. You know, like it was just, it was a game breaker for me. You know, it was something that I, you know, and with that, you know, with all that pain that I experienced as well as that, and, you know, those learning curves, it gave me empathy because I never used to have a great deal of empathy for anyone or anything, but it's given me empathy and, you know, and slowly getting some compassion. And now like I'm completely open-minded about anything, you know, if people want to believe in what, whatever they want to believe in, that's completely up to them, but on them, because if it helped you be a better person, if it helped you through the hardships that's going to come at you through life, because every single one of us will get hardships in life, you know, what levels, Everyone's levels are different, but that doesn't matter. So that person, that level can be as bad as mine. It doesn't. The levels don't matter. It just depends what your mind can handle. And um, that's something that I've become more and more like daily, you know, through practicing my, the twelve step program, through the spirituality which I've discovered, and like a, a deeper connection with what I believe the world around me and everyone else. You know, like it's it has been a complete mind blowing journey. And I've been sober 17 months and all the material things that I ever had, all the people that, and everything I had in my life. And I always wanted more to be somewhere else. I don't need that anymore because I wasn't happy with who I was inside because I didn't even know who I was. I didn't know who Reese was. But getting to know Reese and learning to know who I am has given me the ability to feel the love for the people who love me the most. And that has made given me a contentment and a peace and you know serenity, which I never believed possible. And that people hear people talk about it in the room, but you just think that it's not it's not possible. They're talking crap. But it's by all those processes I've talked about, it's delayed, enabled me to get to this point where by being completely, you know radically transparent and honest in all my affairs at all times, it's allowed me to be able to do all those other things and be peaceful and being able to meditate and be at one and be quiet, quiet in my mind and be more present, you know, live for the day, live for the moment, you know, not look back, not look forward, just enjoy that, that day. And that's been such a help for me. Yeah, that's brilliantly put. I mean, there's so many great things about the 12-step program. One is, you know, the idea of taking responsibility and saying, you know, okay, what's my role in this? The, the thing about, you know, really thinking about, well, if people, are, and this is not just particular to AA, yeah, lots of other places have it as well, but this idea of, well, if people are doing that, that stuff, whatever they're doing, there's probably a reason for that. And maybe... So you say until I've stepped into their shoes, I can't possibly know. I, I know what it feels like when they do it around me, but yeah. what if I step beyond that and, and looked deeper? And this other thing about being kind, not just to them, but mm. to yourself, which is kind of essential in so many spiritual, religious, therapeutic practices as a kind of ground zero. If you don't do that, then everything else stinks. You know, you, you can be nice to other people, like you were saying, when you were smiling on the outside, but you weren't on the inside. Yeah. what's interesting is it stinks and people can see it, but yeah. more, most importantly, you know it inside. There's yeah. something that doesn't quite fit with it. Yeah. I, w I was just completely, so I was completely empty, you know, towards the end of my drinking, to, even in my, in my early recovery. I had no identity because you know, my ego had become my identity. And, you know, it was, it was just, it's been a complete, you know, journey of self-discovery. That's the only way I can put it. And do self-discovery and not me and not actually about myself, about like, you know, what is it? What can I do to feel better about me? I was morally bankrupt. I, I, had, a, I had an emptiness in me, which I've managed to now fill with, you know, a spirit, 
where you know through meditation and through helping others and giving back that is gives me a purpose and that newfound purpose has given me what I see as a path in life to, to which I'm gonna to you know if I can help anyone through you know and I'm and I'm looking for things to do collaborations I'm looking for you know actively looking for work um and I you know I know I can be of value to uh, many many businesses or, or, or organizations charities you know I do stuff at, you know at the moment with sporting chance speaking to young footballers in particularly in EFL and Premier League academies um, just trying to make them aware that you know some of the, my life decisions that I made you know things could have been different had I just spoke out about how I was actually feeling you know that that failure you know that fear of failure fear of success fear of confrontation. It was all fear-driven. Everything I did was fear-driven. But I dressed it up as, you know, a correction or um, a whole range of other uh, things that on the on face surface didn't look like fear. But that's all it was. When you Deep look down. back at it, when you look back at it, it uh, through this, you know, it's, it's quite a recent experience for you, the last couple of years, really. What's the most important thing, would you say, that you've learned in that journey? To just be open-minded. To be kind and just to help others, I think those are the three things that have helped me tremendously with feeling better about myself. You know, it's given me, I've just, just helping others because I've so many people have helped me to get back to this point because I was so lost. I was just so lost and so confused and felt so empty. But then to have this newfound feeling, you know, you know of just peace. And, you know, I just want to be able to, to send that message that this is possible, you know, to achieve your dreams, to fall down to the lowest level, your rock bottom, that it is possible to pick yourself back up and to restart your life in a completely different angle. The one that gives you a purpose and, and something to that you want to achieve in your life by helping others. And, you know, that's just something that I want to do. Yeah, well, there's, uh, I was talking about this today in a lecture I was giving about, um, there's a thing called post-traumatic growth, which is you're kind of describing, you may know about it, but it's like when shit happens, you can go down, you can go, oh, it's just it's hopeless, there's no point, and just feel the world's against you. And then at some point for most people, there's a moment where they go, oh, wait a minute. If that hadn't have happened, and I wish it hadn't, because that's the worst way to learn this lesson. But I probably that's probably what I needed. But if I hadn't discovered that, I never would have been heading in this direction. And this is the direction I need to go. And it's like your body has told you enough and it eventually it kicks you so hard. Yeah. And you hear this a lot with people who recover from cancer or serious illness, where they'll say things like, Yeah, you know, on in some bizarre way it was a gift. It's not the kind of gift I would recommend anybody has, but yeah. I don't think I would have found my way in this direction. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, suffering has been my greatest teacher, undeniably. It's, um, you know, I that victim mindset, you know, of mm -hmm. oh, why me, you know, why did I do it? That's gone. You know, I've been able to change that outlook. You know, you know, I don't, I don't think of it like that. I know, I think, what, why did, why has this happened for me? It's like a different way I look at it now. That it's not why is this happening to me. It's just why is it happening for me. Mm. How is this? This is happening to me to make me realize that maybe I need to change the way I'm thinking or to have a different outcome, to go in a different direction, perhaps. I think everything, you know. Like also, I'm very sensitive, so sometimes there can be like fear of rejection. So now I want to be liked by everyone. So if I go into a room. And I feel like someone, you know, doesn't like me or something. I can feel awkward. And then maybe I'll put my ego out there as opposed to real me, which is, you know, it's hard. It's, it's, it's like a defense mechanism. I can't even prevent it. It's like fight or flight. The moment's up. You know? And um, this is all things that I'm learning about myself now. And it's, um, it's just been, it's, it's amazing. Honestly. It does make you realize that then your body must have been in a stress response for decades if it was oh. constantly looking out for danger who's going to attack me how do i need to defend myself that puts you on alert all the time oh 100 mm. you know when you're being dishonest 
And when you're carrying loads of secrets and you're just spinning tails and you're chasing, you're chasing that story around and you know, like they say, it all comes out in the wash. Right? Mm-hmm. And let me tell you, a woman's intuition is the intuition in general is, is real. Do you know what? When you think there's something wrong, there's, there's pretty much, I think I can guarantee you there's something wrong. And, you know, lying to yourself, denial about your lies is just putting, you're bullshitting yourself. But by able to change in that, that from happening, because that's what I was, I lived in a complete circle of lies, you know. But, but now, by not having lies, I mean, I mean, being honest about the smallest thing, it can be like the most irrelevant thing. You know, like the other day, perfect example, I went to Sainsbury's on the, you know, the catch out things. But I, in, just by pushing the screen at the end of paying for my bill, I pushed no bag, but I had taken a bag. But I did not redo it. So then the next time I went, because it's my local Sainsbury's, I went and pushed two bags because I took, <laughs> do you know what I mean? But like, it wasn't sitting well with me, but I just wanted to like get that off my chest because I wasn't happy with that. Mm. And, um, it's been a such, oh my God, mate, it's a such better way of living. It, baggage free, completely baggage free. The way forward, mate. So when people, it's, it's brilliant. And you can see it. I mean, hopefully somebody will be listening to it and they'll hear it in your voice and some people will see the video and you can see you're like a, a happy child. You know, you're just like full of joy when you talk about this. And when you talk about some of the other parts of the stories, that clearly wasn't where it was. The other thing that also happens with post-traumatic growth or when you've gone through something awful and you come out the other side is that, uh, and this is something somebody told me years ago, that, that when they talk about cancer, people go into remission and he says you should actually call it remission because often what people do is go, oh, wait a minute, I've just worked out what's really important for me, my why, you know, what, what I want to do, what my legacy is, what's important for the bigger group of people, the world, my community, whatever it is. So what for you, what, what's kind of come out for you about, and you kind of alluded to it already, but you know, what's the, what's your, what's your, what's your new north? Where are you heading? Where you, what do you want to achieve with this next phase of this version two? of yes. So like, I think the mental health and wellbeing sector, it seems to be where I'm getting dragged down. Um, you know, I didn't really have, anything that I want, like I didn't come out like, boom, that's what I want to do. You know, I, this, it's, that hasn't been the case. That's been, the, I think the bizarrest thing is that I think by openly sharing how I feel about my emotions and feelings, it's kind of opened a few doors about, you know, that honesty of, you know, being able to talk about my problems kind of sent me down this, this avenue. And I feel that, you know, it also needs to be addressed at school because we don't want to, like, I'm, like I said, I'm all about prevention, prevention, right? So when we get to adults and that learned behavior is in, is in us, building us, it's very hard to break that cycle. You know? But if we can impact kids from an early age in schools with in the syllabus, so now I'm working with a charity called the Gloves Are On in Wales um, to try and get a package that we've, an educational package. Um, called See, Speak, Say, which we're trying to get implemented in, into the school syllabus. So, um, and not like next year or the year after, because apparently uh, well-being in some capacity will be in the schools by 2022 in September. Um, I believe in Wales in the syllabus. So, but f- that's not acceptable in my eyes because it was in desperate need prior to COVID. And having two teenagers in my house, I can assure you that, these issues are going to be long-standing, and those of anxiety, you know, depression, the amount of time they spend it on tech, the issues that we know that social media is having on our children's uh, minds, um, it's scary. I think it's real scary, and that's something I definitely want to try and um, help impact. But as in general, just to help people, you know, help people feel better about themselves do the understanding of the mental health and well-being or whether it's just to make them feel better by telling them how I was able to turn it around and um, that I've had a lot of struggles in life, ups and downs, and trust the process you know, and that suffering is not a, necessarily at the time as horrendous as it feels. It's teaching you something. And if you can look at it and see what it, it for what it is, it can be the greatest teacher. 
been amazing. It's been really, really brilliant to hear you speak about you know what is quite a traumatic roller coaster of a journey with its ups and downs and to hear where you are now you know and um, thank you very much for sharing that I think a lot of people listening to this will be be quite moved by it and obviously reflect on themselves and, and some of the stuff we've talked about in terms of okay well where do we need to put our attention not only in our own lives but what needs to change that people don't have to end up having to go through that you know because uh, yeah. I think there's some very important messages that are wider than just to your specific thing. But but I think under the spotlight of success, you know, people go, oh, lucky Reese, he's achieved his dream. You know, you would imagine what a perfect life. And it's so often the case I've worked with a lot of elite performers that inside they're a you know, shivering, you know, unhappy, yeah. unfulfilled wreck because it's not quite what they dreamed it was going to be. And even if it is what they dreamed it was going to be, it's not what they actually wanted. So it's, you know, it's, it's a kind of, the whole idea of success is very interesting as well. To look at. Yeah. But thank you so much for sharing your, your story and your time with us. Um, and if you want to get in touch with Reese, where do they go? Um, well, feel free to contact me on my Instagram, I think it's Reese Thomas 33 or I'll be on Clubhouse or LinkedIn. Yeah, so Reese Thomas 33 on Insta is probably the easiest place, or LinkedIn, or if you're on Clubhouse, do you find him on Clubhouse. Thank you so much for your time, Reese. Thank you, mate. <laughs> Cheers. Bye-bye. The Mind Body Connection Podcast. The Body and the Mind.